Today on Nerd Out, Cardano Token Standards. Welcome back to Nerd Out, the show where we take a look at Cardano. We break it down, but we don't dumb it down. Today we're talking about Cardano Token Standards. So let's dive in. So first thing we need to talk about is native assets. You may have heard these, this term interchangeably with NFTs or fungible tokens, but native assets is, um, is kind of the, the smallest piece of data that's actually on the blockchain. Um, native assets on Cardano are extremely simple. They only contain three things. They contain a policy ID, they contain a name, and they contain an amount. There is no real difference between a fungible token and an F NFT. They are all native assets. The only difference is an NFT, there's one of them, and a fungible token, the amount is set to something higher than one. So what gives a native asset most of their utility on Cardano? And that is the metadata. So today we're going to be talking about the token metadata standards. The first one we're going to talk about is SIP25 metadata standard. This was originally created uh, back in the day by Alessandro, uh, also known as Barry Ailes on Twitter. He's the creator of the NAMI wallet, Space Buds, et cetera, et cetera. The guy's famous. Anyway, he, he does a lot of stuff. These were created before the existence of smart contracts. So this is back in the Mary era was when we first got NFTs. And it was like, we all thought we were really cool. It's like, you can do... NFTs and tokens on Cardano and you don't need to use a smart contract and that's true and that's really cool um, So where how where is this metadata for SIP 25 stored and it's stored as transaction metadata So transaction metadata is ephemeral. So it gets it's on the blockchain Yes, so it does stick around forever, but it's ephemeral in that it's not stored in the current ledger state so the current ledger all it keeps track of is things like where where are the amounts and numbers of tokens, um, and then it, we'll talk a little bit about what kind of data it can it can hold later. But at this time for SIP25, we did not have the ability to store data in the ledger. Um, SIP25 does not really differentiate between what a fungible and non-fungible token is. It's really just up to the wallet or website to guess. Uh, usually they, they do a guess by saying, okay, how many of these are there? Are there? If there's just one of them, then, hey, let's categorize that as an NFT. If there's more than one, oh, we'll, we'll make it a fungible token. Um, it's, it's not a part of the metadata standard to, to guess about that. Uh, so metadata is immutable on the blockchain. So the only way to update it is by dumping more on onto the blockchain. So you have to mint and burn a new copy of the native asset with new transaction metadata. And then that transaction metadata will get picked up by whatever indexer is, is looking at all this transaction metadata. So let's take a little closer look at what some example metadata looks like for the SIP25 standard. Uh, the SIP25 standard, it has the 721 tag that comes from the Ethereum days. Um, you have a policy ID. Here I'm just showing a test website, so it's all zeros. And then the token name here is one of our, our new tokens, one of the songs from Nito. And then all of this data inside of here is following the standard and putting in all the metadata information. It also has a version on it, so there's different versions of this standard. And there's also substandards to this. So this, uh, this particular song, this is following uh, SIP25 version one, but then it's also following the substandard of the music metadata SIP, which is SIP60, and also version one. There's now a SIP60 version two that's, that's been updated since then. Now let's talk about SIP68. SIP68 is a newer standard, also created by Alessandro. Um, this was created in about the same time that he was working on the Space Buds V2 and the wormhole system and all of that. So 
it needed to be smart contract enabled. Um, the metadata is stored as an inline datum value on a UTXO. So instead of storing it as transaction metadata, it gets stored on an actual UTO, like it's tacked onto the end of it. And so as such, it is stored in the current ledger state. So on every node on Cardano, if you have one of these tokens, it is currently sitting in the memory of that node, all of this data about that token. So it's, it's live and active. Um, it also has a number of substandards to differentiate the different token types. So there's uh, what's called a reference token, and that has the name prefixed with parenthesis 100. And that uh, is the one that holds this UTXO. It's kind of like a marker token on the chain. So you know where to find the metadata for any of these other token types. So if you have a token with the same policy and same name, one of them with 100 and say another one with 222, your wallet can look, see the 222, look up where the reference token is, what UTXO it's sitting on, and then get all the metadata for it from that location on the on the ledger. Um, so there's a 222 standard that's for NFTs. 333 standard is for fungible tokens. You know, if you want to specify decimals or whatever in there, you can. And there's a new standard that I just extended, SIP68, to provide this new standard. And that's something I call the rich fungible token, or rather the SIP committee uh, decided together on this name, rich fungible token. And this kind of is combining some aspects of an NFT and a fungible token. So it's like a fungible in that all of them are the same, but then it has some of that rich metadata uh, like an NFT would have, like images and audio and video and, and all that good stuff that would fall under this uh, 444 standard. So if you're a wallet out there, uh, make sure you start, at least add it to your backlog to support all of these new metadata standards. Uh, the other nice thing about SIP68 is that it's updatable. You don't have to mint and burn to update to update the uh, metadata. All you have to do is spend the UTXO that the reference token is sitting on and provide it new inline datum values. So that's kind of how that works. And you can decide who is allowed to update that metadata. You could set it up to where you make an NFT and only the holder of that NFT can do something in a game that would cause, you know, an update to their profile or something like that. If that, if that NFT represented their profile, uh, or you could have, you know, some central authority be the only one that's able to update that token. Um, you could have a DAO that can decide to update metadata for a token. It's it's kind of up to you since it's controlled usually by a smart contract or at least by a multi-sig. Uh, so this is kind of what that metadata looks like. It's a little more dense and it's using, you can see a lot of it is binary encoded because there's not really a string type for the inline datum. You have to just use byte strings and so it's a little, little tougher to work with maybe, but it's not too bad. And the format it follows is pretty much the same as SIP25, except you don't have the policy and the token name because that's held by that reference token itself. There's no need to repeat the data inside this inline datum value. So let's talk about pros and cons now. Let's talk about SIP25 pros. It is dead simple to work with. If you just have, um, you know, a standard PFP NFT drop, um, this, is, this is definitely the way to go. There's no smart contracts required. You just basically need a minting key. If you want to get really, you know, fancy with it, you could do a multi-sig mint type of situation. Um, it's very inexpensive. So the transaction metadata, because it doesn't have to stick around forever, uh, it's cheaper. It has a lower fee to store data there on the blockchain. And it has a simple metadata format. As you saw, it's easy to work with. It's, you can use your, your typical JSON tools to, to work with most metadata in those SIP25 tokens. So let's talk about the cons. Um, it is not smart contract capable. So 
A smart contract cannot see any transaction metadata associated with a given token unless there's some type of central authority that is getting the data from off chain and shoving it into the smart contract there's there's no way to really um, interact with that easily in a smart contract so for example you you couldn't have a jpeg store or a, uh, a marketplace do a trade where you said i want to get um, any space bud that is a tiger um, and i'm willing to pay you know x amount of ada for it whereas if you move forward with the, the new space bud standard which is sip 68 you could do something like that where you say i'm willing to pay for anything that is a tiger because that tiger would be inside the metadata and it could be seen by the smart contract and then somebody else could come along and fulfill that swap for you um, if they in fact had a tiger space bud uh, so the other con of SIP25 is if you want your token to be updatable, you pretty much have to mint burn and keep your policy open forever. Um, what a lot of people do is they'll keep it open for a period of time so that if there's a mistake made, they can kind of correct the mistakes, but eventually they'll want that to lock. Uh, the only really simple way to prove an NFT is an NFT is by locking that policy after a period of time so that you know after that period of time, okay, there is only one of this token, now there can never be another one. Uh, there's smart contract ways to get around that, but again, that's that's pretty complicated. So SIP68 pros, there is a clear designation of token types. This makes things easier for wallets to categorize your tokens. Uh, you can have updatable or upgradable tokens. They are smart contract compatible, and you can do advanced things like decide who controls updating of the token via smart contract. Some of the cons, it is expensive. Uh, using the ledger space to hold this metadata has higher fees than transaction metadata. So there's a lot of metadata, likely it won't all need to be updated, but you do still have to pay for that storage space of it anyway, because it all has to go there um, in the ledger state and it's it's quite a bit more expensive so like if I wanted to create a fairly rich NFT I'm gonna be spending about six and a half ADA to put that token on the blockchain so it's it's quite a bit more expensive um, it is a little more difficult to work with as it usually requires a smart contract there may be some ways to do it just with keys um, but I think you kind of lose a lot of the power if you're not doing some smart contract system with it. So there's, yeah, you're following the standard, but you're not really taking advantage of the standard. And wallet and dApp support is not universally implemented yet. So some wallets may or may not show these tokens properly, but uh, most of them I believe are, are working on it or it's coming soon. So how do you choose for your token project which you want to work with? So the thing you've got to do is start with your requirements. You know, the decision is all about different trade-offs. There's no right answer for every situation or every project. Um, you know, at Drip Drops, we had a pretty simple NFT drop. We chose to go SIP25 for that one. Over at Noom, I used to do SIP25 and we're moving forward with the artist portal. We're going over to SIP68 and those 444 rich fungible tokens. Um, so it kind of depends on your project for what it needs. Uh, do you need to control your cost? Do you need to upgrade the tokens over time? It just kind of kind of depends. So make your decision wisely. And um, with that, that's all I've got. Nerd out. <laughs>